After the 1954 Brown versus Board of Education Supreme Court case that ordered that schools be desegregated, many white Americans, especially in the South, responded with anger to the court's ruling. They did not want desegregation and soon a massive resistance campaign was created to block desegregation at local, state and on a national level level. And if this is the type of content that you enjoy, you can find more content like this at onemichistory.com. Also, if you'd like to support the channel, you can do so on my Patreon page or my Buy Me Coffee in the description below. Additionally, give us five stars on Apple Podcasts and support the YouTube channel. But without further ado, let's get started. In a brief history, early in the 20th century, the United States maintained a legally sanctioned racial caste system. Its premise was that African Americans were inferior to whites. In the crucial area of public school education, segregation was especially disadvantageous to black students. The discrimination affected school facilities, education, materials, teacher salaries, and transportation. And in separate black system, they were clearly inferior to those of white students. African American children were routinely denied opportunities for economic advancement provided to white students by the public school system. So, beginning in the mid 30s, the NAACP launched a legal campaign of equalization, challenging the differences between black and white schools. In 1950, however, the NAACP decided to stop funding equalization lawsuits in favor of attacking segregation directly. 1951, when the public school district of Topeka, Kansas refused to enroll the daughter of a local black student of Oliver Brown to the school closest to her home, instead insisting that she ride the bus to a segregated elementary school further away, so the Browns and 12 other families in similar situations, with the help of the NAACP, filed a class action lawsuit against Topeka, Kansas School Board, alleging that segregation policy was unconstitutional. Brown's case and four other cases first came before the Supreme Court in 1952, and the court combined them into a single case under the name Brown versus the Board of Education of Topeka. On May 17, 1954, the Supreme Court issued its unanimous ruling that racial segregation in public schools was unconstitutional. The Brown verdict outraged white segregationists as much as it energized civil rights activists. Throughout the South, where state constitutions and state laws mandated segregated schools, many whites complained that the decision was a tyrannical exercise of federal power. White Americans implemented a strategy of massive resistance to desegregate or deploy tactics against the growing movement of civil rights. Segregationists used criminalizations, arrests, the imprisonment of peaceful protesters, as well as bombings and murders to prevent desegregation of schools. The origins of the massive resistance had its roots in Virginia. On August 23, 1954, shortly after the Brown decision, the Gray Commission was established. It was an all-white public school commission created by Virginia Governor Thomas B. Stanley, and it was created to study the effects of the Brown versus Board education decision and make recommendations. Before its final report was issued, November 11, 1955, the Supreme Court responded to calls for immediate federally enforced desegregation with the follow-up decision known as Brown II, directing federal district judges to implement segregation with deliberate speed. This vague command only provided for more legal challenges and loopholes, and later in 1955, the commission issued an 18-page report called the Gray Plan, which recommended several strategies aimed at slowing desegregation of public schools. All of these things caused Virginia to become the epicenter of the massive resistance and the Brown II ruling was hailed as a victory for the South. The Brown II ruling emboldened states to undermine the court's desegregation efforts and the decision imposed no deadlines on the beginning or the completion of integration and issued vague guidelines that granted Southern District Court judges broad discretionary oversight. In Louisiana, voters overwhelmingly approved a constitutional amendment that allowed the states to use police powers to keep a school from being being integrated and in North Carolina devised a plan that permitted a local commission to close public schools by popular vote if they were being threatened with imminent desegregation. So by 1956, Senator Byrd of Virginia created a coalition of a hundred Southern politicians to sign his Southern manifesto, an agreement to resist the implementation of Brown versus the Board of Education. On February 25th, 1956, Senator Byrd issued a call for 
for massive resistance, accusing the Supreme Court of a clear abuse of judiciary powers and to use all lawful means to bring about its reversal. In response, they called for a series of laws that aggressively attempted to forestall or prevent schools from being integrated. For example, the massive resistance doctrine included a law that punished any public school that integrated by eliminating state funds and eventually closing the school. Legislators in eight southern states, Alabama, Arkansas, Florida, Georgia, Louisiana, Mississippi, South Carolina, and Virginia also enacted interposition resolutions which denounced Brown as an illegal encroachment on states' rights and declared it null and void and to have no effect. In addition to this legislative resistance, white population in the South mobilized in mass to nullify the Supreme Court decree. In states across the South, whites set up private academies to educate their children and some counties even closed public schools altogether, as well as using those public funds to support the attendance of children in segregated facilities. That was until the use of public funds for private academies was successfully challenged in court. The massive resistance was spread beyond the opposition of simply school desegregation and would come to encompass a broad agenda in defense of racial prejudice of traditional means in the South. Some Southern states would outlaw the NAACP and after a local city council calculated the roster of NAACP members in Clarity County, South Carolina, all of those members listed promptly lost their jobs, credit, and suppliers. In 1956, Georgia incorporated the Confederate flag into a state flag and within a few years, South Carolina and Alabama began flying the Confederate flag at their state capitals. Even President Eisenhower did not personally support the Brown versus Board ruling. He would probably state that I don't believe you can change the hearts of men with laws. Because of this, virtually no segregation occurred in former Confederate states until 1957. Meanwhile, in the fall of 1957, in response to the Brown decision, African American and the NAACP in Little Rock, Arkansas pressured the school board and they adopted a gradual plan for integration of their schools. The first institution to be integrated would be the public high schools beginning in September of 1957. Among them was Little Rock Central High School. Nine black students then registered to be the first African Americans to attend Central High School. Warned by the Little Rock School Board not to attend on the first day, the nine black students arrived on the second day accompanied by a small group of ministers. In addition, 270 Arkansas National Guard was sent by Arkansas Governor Orville Eugene Flabus, blocking the school's entrance and a large white mob gathered in front of the school and began shouting, throwing stones and threatening to kill the students. The confrontation in Little Rock drew international attention to racism and civil rights in the United States, as well as the battle between state and federal powers. Television and newspaper reports devoted substantial coverage to the Little Rock Nine and Dwight Eisenhower and Governor Flabus and Little Rock's Mayor Woodrow Mann discussed the situation over the next 18 days, during which time the nine students would stay home. The students returned to high school on September 23rd, entering through a side door. They were eventually discovered, however, and white protesters became violent, attacking African-American bystanders. The students were then sent home. Eisenhower would in turn send the one-on-one airborne to Little Rock Arkansas and place the Arkansas National Guard under federal command to protect the students. The troops remained in Arkansas for the entire 1957-1958 school year and after troops were withdrawn, however, Governor Flavors closed Little Rock Public High Schools for the entire 1958-1959 school year. And many other states authorized the closing of public schools to attempt to avoid desegregation. In 1956, Virginia Public Assembly passed a law requiring the closure of any public schools where white and black children were enrolled together and to cut off state funding for integrated schools. States also redirected those public funds to maintain segregated education. After Virginia's highest court invalidated the 1956 laws closing and defunded integrated schools, lawmakers enacted a freedom of choice program that created tuition grants for white students to attend the private school of their choice. Additionally, officials in Prince Edwards County, Virginia closed the entire public school system in 1959 after federal court ordered integration and instead created private schools for white students using state grants and county tax credits to cover tuition expenses. Over 90% of the county's white students enrolled in the new all-white private schools, while more than 1,700 black students in the county had no state-funded educational option for five years until the Supreme Court overturned Virginia's tuition grants and forced the public schools to reopen. 
federal court struck down state efforts to selectively close public schools to avoid integration, but those rulings failed to stop white residents from fleeing public schools. By 1963, after the federal court ordered the integration of Macon County, Alabama, Governor George Wallace temporarily closed Tuskegee High School to prevent 13 black students from enrolling. When the school reopened, all 275 white students had withdrawn and most of them used state-funded scholarships to enroll in Macon County Academy, a newly formed all-white private school. Because of this, by 1960, in the five Deep South states, every single one of the 1.8 million black children attended a segregated school by the fall of 1960. And by the start of the 1964-1965 school year, less than 3% of the South African American children attended school with white students. And in Alabama, Arkansas, Mississippi, Georgia, South Carolina, that number remained lower than 1%. Meanwhile, November 1960, after state legislature attempted to block the federal court from ordering the desegregation of New Orleans schools failed, a mob organized outside two elementary schools where four black students had enrolled. Escorted by federal marshals, six-year-old Ruby Bridges started the first grade at an all-white elementary school and was greeted with hundreds of vicious protesters spitting and yelling obscenities at first graders who had just wanted to attend their first day of school. A group of white mothers gathered daily to scream at the children and one mother threatened to poison Ruby Bridges on her second day of school and another presented her with a black doll and a wooden coffin. When Ruby Bridges arrived at her assigned classroom, her and her teacher were the only two people present. All of the white children have withdrawn from the school and Ruby Bridges remained the only student in her classroom for the entire school year. Her family members faced threats and retaliation. The local store banned Ruby Bridges' family from entering and Ruby Bridges' father lost his job and her grandparents were evicted from the Mississippi farm where they worked as sharecroppers. Years after the Brown decision, up to a quarter of Southerners admitted to pollsters that they favored violence if necessary to prevent school desegregation. The White Citizens Council, which mostly consisted of middle-class white segregationists, spread rapidly throughout the South. By 1956, they had more than 250,000 members. The White Citizens Council claimed that they rejected violence, but their rhetoric suggested otherwise. A handbill circulated at a large council rally in Montgomery, Alabama, denounced segregation and the that when the course of human events becomes necessary to abolish Negro race, proper means should be used, among them guns, bows and arrows, slingshots, and knives. Law enforcement and white elected officials tolerated and even encouraged racial violence and terroristic acts. Many in law enforcement or members of the White Citizens Council or the Ku Klux Klan and all white juries consistently acquitted those charged with violence against black people and effectively immunizing perpetrators of racial violence from punishment. After the murder of Mississippi civil rights activist Vernon Dahmer, Klansman Sam Bowers boasted that after being indicted for that murder, that no jury would convict a white man killing a nigger in Mississippi. He was right. He wasn't convicted until 1998. By 1967, a report in the U.S. Commission for Civil Rights observed that violence against Negroes continues to be a major deterrent in school desegregation. 14 years after Brown versus the Board of Education, the massive resistance would meet a formal end to Supreme Court ruling in Green v. County School Board of Kent County, which deemed that nearly all segregationist tactics were in violation of federal law. The Supreme Court held that the Freedom of Choice Plan, which allowed students to pick the school that they wanted to attend, was not a sufficient step in the desegregation of public schools. While the Freedom of Choice Plan may work in some situations, school districts must must provide a plan that works to dismantle school segregation in their district. The massive resistance in its aftermath left a deep, long-lasting negative imprint on public schools by delaying the effect of desegregation into the late 60s. Despite its best efforts, many parts of the American South continued to see white backlash against desegregation. It took the form of lawsuits, school closures, evictions of black families, procedural delays, and physical blockades and mob violence. This provided time for substantial numbers of white students to withdraw into privately, usually white only academies. It was not until the Legal Defense Fund's victories in Green versus County School Board and Swan versus Mecklenburg County that the Supreme Court issued mandates that segregation must be dismantled root and branch. 
In these rulings, the court outlines specific factors that must be considered in elimination of the effects of segregation and ensure that the federal court was able to exercise its judicial authority in desegregation. Thank you. This has been One Mike Black History. I'm your host, Country Boy, and this has been the Massive Resistance. If you like stories like this, you can find more stories like this at OneMikeHistory.com. Also, if you want to support the channel, you can do so by buying me coffee on Patreon page in the description below. Also, give us five stars on Apple Podcasts and support the YouTube channel. Peace.